Hello and you're very welcome to this uh, Mythical Ireland video. Today I am using Google Earth, uh, one of my favourite programs of all time. This is Google Earth Pro. Hard to believe this software is free to download. I've been using it for years, for 15 years to, uh, to research, you know, archaeology, alignments of ancient sites, etc, etc, looking at the landscape. Uh, every so often the imagery gets updated so you get fresh views of um, a particular area and uh, there's a, a lovely uh, feature in uh, Google Earth where you can select the uh, the date from the, the date slider and just change the imagery. Anyway, today's video is going to focus on something that the archaeologists have been saying for a long time about the stones, the great stones at Newgrange, the uh, the stones that make up the curb and a lot of the structural stones. These are a type of stone called a grey wacky. It's a funny name. It's a muddy sandstone or a shale. Now, the geologists tell us that this stone is not... Uh, uh, brought to or wasn't brought to Newgrange from the immediate vicinity but was rather brought from a good distance away that distance being so just to before I suppose before we start just to give you a rough idea of where we are we're on the east coast of Ireland and this is the Boyne River this is the Irish Sea and the Irish coastline let's make sure we're, we're north this is the the so-called bend of the Boyne and within the bend of the Boyne are contained the great megalithic monuments of Nouth, which is here. Newgrange, or originally as it was called, Sheedin Broga, here. And to the east, Douth, with the large crater in it left by the 1847 botched excavations. Anyway, we're not talking about that today. Today we're showing you the source uh, for, for the, the Grey Wacky which we're told was down at Clore Head on the coast. Uh, Clore Head is a headland, a modern day fishing village. There's the village of Clore Head, there's the fishing pier uh, that juts out into the sea. Now it's a very unique, uh, it has very unique geology. Uh, so very briefly, and this is described in another video um, which I made for my patrons, my Mythical Ireland patrons on Patreon pertaining to the fascinating geology of Clara Head. The northern part of Ireland and the southern part of Ireland were once located on two separate continents and those continents came together about 400, I think perhaps 420 million years ago. And so before then they were separated, the northern part and the southern part. And there's a, a seam that runs from Limerick, uh, approximately speaking, the, uh, the Shannon Estuary in the southwest across Ireland up to the northeast where it emerges along the coast at Clare Head. Now uh, the ocean that separated the continents uh, was is termed by the geologists the Iapetus Ocean and the continents they call uh, Laurentia and Avalonia. Now the seam they refer to as the Iapetus Suture. Now the significance here is that the fossils found on the northern part of Ireland which was once part of a uh, uh, a different continent uh, are, are entirely different to the fossils found to the south of the seam uh, because they were on land masses that were once separated by an ocean that was apparently 3,000 kilometres wide. Incredible stuff. The only place in Ireland where the Apatis suture has surface expression, can be seen at the surface, is at Clotter Head, where the sedimentary rock, I mean, remember this is a shale, um, th thrusts out from the land vertically so instead of seeing the layers horizontally as you might expect from um, a, a sedimentary rock they're actually vertical so they're layered uh, vertically we're told that the Newgrange builders uh, were able to take advantage of this because what they were able to do was prize specimens off uh, using probably wooden poles to, to, to break big chunks of the rock off from these vertical formations and then we're told that they were brought down along the coast by boat. Now, we have no um, evidence, uh, material, physical evidence of what type of boat or what size boats. There was a Neolithic boat found in the Boyne a couple of years ago, but it was a log boat and not the sort of boat you would expect to have large curb stones strapped to the underneath large slabs of grey wacky But the thinking is anyway uh, among the archaeological community that the stones one by one were brought 
uh, from Clarehead Head down along the coast and up the River Boyne. That's quite a distance. And uh, you have to bear in mind the number of stones that are involved. So there are 97 curb stones forming a belt around the base of the Mount of Newgrange. And there are further 100 stru large structural stones inside. So passage orthostats, capping stones, chamber stones and roofing stones. Approximately 200 large slabs of, of weighing at least one tonne apiece. The average weight of the curb stones at Newgrange is three tons and the largest of them I think weighs about 10 tons. These apparently were all brought from Clotter Head and just to give you an idea uh, I just want to use the uh, sorry I'm just having trouble accessing it here I want to use the uh, the ruler tool just to show you this so we'll just approximately measure the distance from Newgrange to Clotter Head as the crow flies and that's a distance to the coast of about 12 and a half miles a little bit more uh, over 20 kilometers so that's some distance but that is as the crow flies now in my 2012 book Newgrange Monument Immortality I estimated that the actual distance of the journey was something closer to 30 kilometers because you have to account for the journey down along the coast and up along the river which meanders quite a bit so what I'm going to do today is well the intention today is to, to, to try and trace the journey down along the coast and up the river and just see how far indeed you know the uh, people who built Newgrange travelled. Now remember that so the process is apparently break off a slab of rock it weighs at least a ton probably three tons maybe five tons you put a barge on top of it a boat on top of it you strap the stone to the boat you wait for the tide to rise it floats out onto the sea and then you bring it down along the sea and pilot it up the river. Now, remember that for Newgrange, there are at least 200 of these journeys and that's in each direction. And then for Nauth, there are, there are probably at least another two or 300 uh, stones. Now, they're at Nauth, the curb stones are, are, are formed of a variety of different types of rock, including dolerite and other stones. But there are still quite a number of grey wacky slabs in the interior of its two passageways and then when you factor in the satellite mounds of both Nauth and Newgrange and the other mounds in the area which are probably passage tombs and probably have stones in them you could be uh, conservatively we're, we're looking at 500 journeys but possibly um, I mean maybe several hundred more than that uh, who knows so that is one of the things to uh, take into account uh, when we're looking at this today. Now, uh, some of you may have seen, I, I made another video about Clara Head, including some drone footage from the headland uh, to show you how steeply uh, the cliffs actually fall away here, which isn't really obvious looking at the Google Earth imagery. You don't see it in three dimensions, so you don't see the fall away. Um, so it's not really practical to talk about breaking stones off here out on the eastern side of the head where basically you're at the base of a cliff and the waves are lashing you up against the cliffs. More likely you were in a beach setting. So somewhere probably north of Clara Head in this area where the rock outcrops are visible again as um, vertical layered formations and where you have something of an inlet or a beach uh, where you can rest the stone, put the, the barge on top of it and then wait for the tide to, to raise it and, and head off out to sea. A much safer way of doing things. Now in that regard, there's a very interesting feature here um, to the northwest or to the, the nor to the west of the modern pier at uh, Port Oriel in Clower Head, which is the fishing pier. Uh, and that is this very straight line of rocks. I, I've visited this site uh, in in uh, probably 2011, 2012, um, just before um, I published my Newgrange book. And uh, this is marked apparently on some of the old maps as New Cummins Pier of unknown date, but definitely man-made, a very straight edge thing there. I just wonder whether this particular little bay inlet, which has a channel accessing the sea, might have been a suitable place where you might have put the stone down and attached it to the barge uh, if you're a prehistoric um, uh, megalith uh, builder uh, of the Boyne Valley, uh, that this might have been just one of those areas. Who knows, maybe this thing is much more ancient uh, there are very very large rocks making it up 
but we don't know. It's on the National Monuments um, a viewer. Actually, I think I can bring that up. Uh, it was reported to the National Monuments by Gerald Kelleher from Clarehead Head uh, at low tide at near Port Oriel Pier is a submerged wall believed to be an ancient harbour. So there you go. So anyway, what we're going to do today is trace that journey, but we're going to use the path tool in Google Earth. So we're going to basically uh, try to come up with a reasonably good estimate as to exactly how far it is for each of those uh, stone journeys from Clarehead Head down to Brunebonia. So for the purpose of this video, I'm going to assume that the location where the stones were brought from is this inlet or this uh, little pier uh, on the northern side of the head of Clarehead. Head. In terms of where the, the, the stones were landed, we don't know the landing point. Uh, that would be speculation. We have to assume for the moment um, until uh, firm evidence comes in that the stones were brought um, somewhere within the vicinity of Newgrange and from the river up to the Great Mount. Anyway, we're going to try and retrace this journey now. Just see what it's like in terms of distance and then just see what give us. It might give us some little impression as to what might have been involved for these builders. So with the path tool selected in Google Earth, I'm going to measure in kilometers for the moment. Um, in Ireland now, because we're Euro European, we use kilometers. We used to use miles. I will do the conversions at the end, so we'll we'll know what it is in miles as well. So let's just say that your uh, prehistoric mariner is setting out, or your mariners in their barge, and they're putting to sea through this inlet. And we'll keep a certain distance off the coast just to account for, you know, um, possible shallows, etc. I mean, I'm not a mariner and I haven't sailed uh, around the coast of Ireland, so I can't really say one way or the other what the sort of depth of the water there might be the pier is modern so we just pretend that that's not there that was only built in the uh, probably in the last century and we'll take a, a skirt a skirting journey around the eastern side of Clarehead. head so you can see how quickly the distance adds up now bear in mind that uh, uh, these uh, individuals from the neolithic are um sailing in some sort of a barge or a boat with a massive stone strapped to the bottom of it i'm not sure if they had sails or whether they did it entirely you know whether they piloted the boat entirely using oars uh, but we can imagine it's a slow journey i'm i've already traveled here virtually 5.7 kilometers uh, this is obviously taking place at a, a much greater speed than the real journey would take place Again, it gives us an idea because uh, we have to factor into account the the many journeys that were undertaken, hundreds of them, hundreds of them, with one stone at a time. And remember, this is the inward journey. There was also a return outward journey with the empty boat to go back and collect the next stone. Now, in my book, Newgrange Monument Immortality, which I've already mentioned, there is a chapter called Community Effort, and I talk about the possibilities in terms of the numbers of people that were involved. If there was only one boat, there are five, six, seven, eight hundred journeys that have to be ma made. If if there are, for instance, three boats and there's six hundred rocks, that's two hundred journeys each. It's incredible. Uh, we're constantly uh, perplexed and astonished and in awe of the achievements of these builders. Here, the journey uh, turns inwards towards the mouth of the Boyne. Now, these walls, the 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 uh, the bull walls of the Boyne estuary were actually um, only built in, I think, the 19th century. Uh, and actually, uh, the I think the southern one was the location where the Tara brooch was found. And if you want to learn more about that, there's a blog post on my website, mythicalireland.com, about that. Anciently called Inverculpa, this is where the River Boyne finally meets the sea on its meandering journey all the way down from Sheenachton up at Carberry, the modern village of Carberry in County Kildare, and Necton's Well, or the Well of Segish, which is said to be its origin. Lots more about that in my books, and probably something I will do blogging and um, 
podcasting about in the future because it's come up uh, in a recent book that I've just finished that is not published yet. Anyway, we're heading now uh, upriver uh, uh, along the Boyne and we've entered the modern town of Drogheda. And the big sort of gateway feature there is the Boyne Viaduct carrying the Dublin Belfast railway line. That is not a Neolithic feature. It was completed in 1855 AD. Uh, So a lot uh, younger and newer than Newgrange, which is dated to 3100 BC or approximately uh, 5100 years ago. Just at this point. So we've we've travelled more than 19 kilometres already. Uh, What's that in miles? Uh, almost 12 miles uh, we reach uh, St Mary's Bridge in Drogheda uh, which is what gives the town its name Drogheda Aha which means the bridge at the ford the first bridge which is probably a wooden bridge uh, built in the first millennium AD uh, was built in a- adjacent to the location of the fording point of the river so in pre-bridge times to cross a river you used a ford which is a shallow place usually had stones in it sometimes um, those fords would be augmented with extra stone to make the crossing easier. So the bridge at the ford is the ancient name of Drogheda. And there's Millmount there, which is a, a martello tower built by the British Army in the early 19th century AD, but which sits on a mound that is said to have been built by historians, uh, built by the Normans, the Anglo-Normans in the 12th century, but in fact is more likely to be a prehistoric burial mound and that's suggest long been suggested in local folklore and uh, something explored in great detail in my book with Richard Moore Island of the Setting Sun in search of Ireland's ancient astronomers uh, and something that has been explored um, by archaeologists in recent years who now believe yes it is likely to be a prehistoric burial mound and just following the the meandering curve of the river here I I document this in my Newgrange book about how this is a dangerous area of the river because you have to follow the channel exactly there are several mud flats and islands that are are not far beneath the surface so one has to know the river quite well to navigate it and under the Boyne Cable Bridge uh, which carries the M1 motorway uh, Dublin Belfast motorway over the river Boyne that's another modern iconic structure not dating to the Stone Age So anyway, here at Yellow Island, uh, the river starts to narrow. um, And I suppose the the journey uh, anciently must have been a precarious enough one trying to um, navigate the meandering river and to avoid these mudflats. But we'll see now shortly what happens is that, you know, some distance to the west of Drogheda, um, the, the river takes a dramatic turn so occasionally we're meeting these uh, weirs the weirs uh, salmon weirs uh, were built um, it is said by historians that they were built by the Cistercians who were a religious order who established uh, Mellifont Abbey in the 12th century AD they're also the ones that gave Newgrange its name because their farms were called Granges and there are four townlands in the Bend of the Boyne area which apparently are Norman names because they're Grange. Uh, they have Grange in them. New Grange is one, Rough Grange, Little Grange and Sheep Grange. Um, so the Normans had quite an influence. Obviously in the Neolithic times, these weirs, and here's another one, were not, uh, were not there. Although they may have had weirs possibly constructed of um, something like willow wattle or something like that, um, interweaved uh, willow or... Or, or, or Hazelwood or something like that. That's the bridge over the river at Old Bridge, the Obelisk Bridge. It used to be an obelisk on this piece of rock here. It was blown up at some stage in, I think, the early 20th century. And we pass then the Strahada to Slane Road, passes close to the river here beneath the wood of Townley Hall and opposite uh, Old Bridge House. And here's what happens at the Curly Hole. The river turns very dramatically to the south. So this is the beginning of Bruna Bonia, as it were, the beginning of the Great Bend of the Boyne. There is another portion specifically containing the uh, monuments. You can see that it's difficult for me to follow the exact course of the river because, you know, there are these islands and I'm not sure which of these courses would have been taken. But anyway, we'll follow we'll follow one. This is obviously not scientific. It's a rough estimate of the distance involved and and um, it gives you an idea too of, of just how far they travelled and the sort of obstacles they may have met. There's another met, sorry, they would have met. There's another um, 
uh, weir again that would not have been there so professor frank mitchell who was a, a geologist and an anthropologist and many things he actually lived at townley hall which is which is uh, which is just up here um he's deceased now professor mitchell said that in the neolithic the Boyne was navigable, uh, sorry, the Boyne was tidal all the way up to Nouth, which is the far reaches of the bend of the Boyne. And that's because there are apparently um, some sort of marine deposits there, which suggest that at one time the river was um, tidal all the way up there. So we've come a distance of 27 and a half kilometres and we're still not there. The river is is heading in a, an approximately southwesterly direction here we've passed uh glenmore and are now going to turn sharply to the west as you can see so our initial journey was just around tw something like 20 kilometers wasn't it Tw uh, 12 just over 12 and a half miles in terms of the as the crow flies distance between newgrange and clarahead uh, for some reason that's not clicking now we find ourselves uh 28 almost 29 kilometers into the journey and we're still not there which is you know nine kilometers more than the the as the crow flies distance so you can see uh, and this is exactly what i wanted to demonstrate you can see how you know each journey was quite a significant journey there's another salmon we're quite a significant journey remember that you have to have done this in conjunction with the tide which means that you know um you know there are two tides in the day there's usually a daytime and a nighttime tide in the summer you might get two tides where there's enough light uh you know to do the two journeys in daylight so this is tide reliant as well as everything else you can't just deposit the stone and head back and keep coming and keep coming at whatever time you like uh, it's all dependent on the tides we're just passing under the footbridge here which connects the Brunabonia visitor center with the bus park where you get the buses when you're going on your official visit to the center and there's the car park for the visitor center it's nicely tucked away hidden away so as not to be intrusive in the landscape uh, and i suppose here now we're about to turn for the i suppose the final run uh, towards Brunabonia and you can imagine what it's like to be a salmon by the way uh, trying to navigate the river and trying to uh, jump all those weirs on the way and so here is another salmon weir and we're just uh, heading westwards now we're not too far away now but you can see uh, just uh, how much the river meanders so it's called the bend of the Boyne and if we just zoom out a bit you'd see that there are actually quite a lot of bends you know so it, it here's where it turns south and actually southeastwards before heading south again and this area is of course the Brunabonia area I need to be careful I don't want to lose my my path here um, not exactly sure which way to go around this island we're going to go north of it again it'll give us a rough idea uh, it's not it's not a, it won't give us an exactly precise distance but it'll give us i suppose a distance um probably within probably within maybe five percent of the actual distance involved in navigating the river from clara head down to brunabonia which are huge stones here's mound b along the flood plain of the boyne that is also known as Dogda's Mount, and again, I have uh, a blog post about that on mythicalireland.com about how, after Angus dispossessed his father, uh, the Dogda, who was the chief of the gods of ownership of Newgrange, um, he, uh, uh, the Dogda, uh, had to go to another mound, and that was the one. Now, just for the sake of argument, I'm going to suggest that the builders made a landing somewhere here. Okay. We don't know the location where they landed. I don't think that has been ascertained uh, by archaeologists at this time. Um, but certainly we know that they have to have beached the stone uh, and brought it up onto land, onto the shore, uh, where presumably a team of people was ready uh, to haul it up the bank. Now, that distance, ladies and gentlemen, is 31.34 kilometres or... 19 let's call it 19 and a half miles um oh yeah so it's a little bit 
more than my estimate in Newgrange Monument to Immortality, where I said probably 30 kilometres. It's just over that. It's 31.34 kilometres. Now, at this point, I'm going to actually save that path. Uh, let's call it... Um, let's just call it Clarehead Newgrange. Okay. So I can actually save that. And I can even save my places. Okay. So it's in red there now. So now I think that gives you an idea of the... Well, I suppose we have to address several things. The amount of manpower involved. Uh, the amount of willpower and ingenuity involved. And then the determination. Um, you know, that community zeal that must have been involved. There is no way that Newgrange and the Great Monuments and all of the other monuments in the Bend of the Boyne dating to the Neolithic and the Late Neolithic, there's no way that they were built just by the local community who were living in the area. We don't think that would have been substantial enough. We think that, uh, and when I say we, I think me and probably several uh, members of the archaeological community, that you're looking here really at a regional project, something that Connor Brady talks about uh, in my book, Newgrange Monument to Immortality, that there are large numbers involved, there's no doubt. And it's organised labour, so there has to be some sort of a hierarchy. I mean, somebody has to have taken charge of all this. You've got the pilot of the boat, OK, but presumably you have assistants, people who are helping to steer the boat. You've got to have, you have to have a team of people, I think, down at Clower Head to prise off the rocks and to pre prepare them uh, for the sailing. You also have to have a team or several teams of people here along the southern shore, sorry, along the northern shore, uh, uh, or the southern um, end of the the promontory of land that we call Brunabonia, uh, to to prepare the last bit of the journey, which is um, bringing the stone up the incline to Newgrange. And by the way, um, again, that's in the Newgrange book. That is a distance of about a kilometre uh, and up an incline of about 60 metres. That's from page uh, 54 of Newgrange Monument to Immortality. Uh, and so we can just do a quick measure of that with the, the ruler tool, uh, not the path tool. This time we'll use the ruler just to give us a rough idea. Yeah, point. Yeah, it's it's, it's 920 metres or so, just a little bit under a kilometre. Uh, just over half a mile up a steep incline. So we don't know how they did that. Did they put them on logs and roll them up there? Were there huge teams of men and women involved? The mythology, by the way, says that only the men built the monuments. Was Were, were they using cattle, oxen, you know, um, to, to, to help uh, reduce the, the, the human workload needed? We don't know. Uh, but we are fascinated by that nonetheless. So just to reiterate, okay, just to give us an idea of the scale of the task, which undoubtedly took a long time. There are three great monuments. The Schiedenbroga, uh, its ancient name, now known as Newgrange, with 97 curbstones. Nouth, with 127 curbstones and 18 satellite mounds around it all of which also contain uh, amounts, varying amounts of that rock, type of rock, that uh, muddy shale, that grey wacky, and Douth. And you can see uh, Douth was partly excavated in the 1840s, a very botched uh, treasure hunting ex 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 expedition that uh, left a crater on top. You can see some of the curb stones are exposed. The estimate there at Douth is 115. Although uh, I, I, I believe that, you know, the, the archaeologists think that they certainly used some of the glacial erratics that have been deposited in the Bend of the Boyne by the, uh, during the Ice Age, by the ice sheets, um, and that Doubt was the first of the three to be built. But also then, you know, so the Clara Head, in terms of the source of the stone, okay, they are the largest stones. But there's another source, and the reason I have it pinned is so that I can find it easily. 
There's another source further to the north uh, where if you've ever been to Newgrange and you've seen the white quartz facade uh, of Newgrange, that is the stone, all of that stone is original. That was brought to the monument 5,000 years ago. It is supported now by a concrete wall to keep it safe, uh, to keep the structure safe, because the structure did collapse at some point uh, within, we're told, five centuries of Newgrange being built. But if you go uh, and look at that quartz interspersed with that are these granite and granodiorite cobbles, uh, water rolled or sea rolled cobbles. They were found, I just have to change the date of the imagery here because the clouds are hindering the view here. And they're still hindering the view in places. <laughs> okay. So there's a there's a stony beach here at Rathcore, uh, Temple Town, uh, on the southern shore of the, the Cooley Peninsula. Uh, and that is a stone beach. They're all stones of varying sizes just it's not a sandy beach it's difficult to walk on actually because it's entirely made of stone i was there there's a video on youtube i'll try and put a link uh, with this video um i was there and you you know i have a picture of it in my book you can walk along at rathcore and find examples of the the uh the sea rolled cobbles at new grinch and you can just imagine precisely that you've bridged uh, uh, a, a time span of 5,000 years uh, by by standing on that shore and looking at the same stones that are on the front of Newgrange and saying, wow, you know, people came here 5,000 years ago to do that. Anyway, just to give you an idea, a rough idea of the distance involved there, let's just do a rough line of sight, not line of sight, uh, as the crow flies uh, distance to Newgrange from Rathcore. 36.66 kilometers or almost not far off 23 miles so you can imagine when you add in you know uh, let's do it another way let's clear that and let's 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 create a rough path just to give us an idea so Rathcore beach and let's head straight down along the sea past Clara head and this is going to be very rough now Okay, because we're not gonna not gonna spend the the intricate time that we did on the last one. Ah, let's just do it very roughly. Well, that's already thirty miles, which I think is about fifty kilometers, forty-eight point three nine kilometers. So again, there's a huge distance involved, and again where coordination is needed there must have been some sort of hierarchy um involved in the construction teams of people who's leading the clara head boats how many boats are there who's piloting each one how many people are on each team the land team that drags the curb stones up to the great monuments how many people how many teams are there the wrath core cobbles how many boats uh, how many people and then of course is the quartz uh, the white quartz on the front of Newgrange, which is said to have come all the way from the Wicklow Mountains, which are south of Dublin, and uh, very approximately, very, very roughly. Let's just do a, 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 a again, this is line of, uh, sorry, as crow flies, 66 kilometres, a distance of 41 miles, and again up the coast and up the river. Uh, a second suggestion, and a more recent suggestion for the source of the uh, the white quartz at Newgrange is the islands of Rockabill off the coast of County Dublin and if you want to read more about Rockabill and its mythology and its winter solstice alignment with the Baltray standing stones you should read Island of the Setting Sun uh, my first book with Richard Moore anyway I hope that's given you some idea of the impressive uh, nature of the the Clare Head journeys you know uh, the fact that people went to a place to source stone that could be worked loose and that could be brought uh, down along the coast um, the fact that they made so many of these journeys and the fact that it was such dangerous work I mean this is a community that was very very organized and not just organized I, mean, I think the important thing here is that they were led by some unifying vision some 
cosmic vision, some something that made them work together for the common good. And that's something that did not continue into the Bronze Age, by the way, after the uh, Neolithic population suffered uh, some sort of a calamity. There was a fairly large collapse in the uh, the size of the population. Um, these are people, by the way, who didn't live very long. The maximum life expectancy in the Neolithic was 40 years of age. The average life expectancy for a female was 26 and for a male, 28. So again, we are constantly in awe of what these people were able to achieve. They were smaller and lighter than us. That doesn't necessarily mean they weren't uh, strong people, um, but I doubt that they had the same level of nutrition as modern people ha have and they definitely didn't have the health care that we have and that's something i explore in the new grange book is the fact that when uh, somebody encounters an accident uh, hauling these stones perhaps one of the stones falls over and traps somebody's leg and they get a broken leg that would often lead to death that's not the sort of thing in the neolithic where you just head off to your local hospital and have uh, fixed up by the surgeons anyway we are as i said in 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 awe this journey is just one we can imagine this is the first of hundreds of such journeys and after depositing the stone exhausted perhaps they're heading back to Clara Head again to do it all over again. Fascinating stuff, I think you'll agree.